Chapter Eight of the Adventures of Mabel by Harry Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, The Animal Party. Mabel said, "Grandma, one morning, do you know what tomorrow will be?" "No," said Mabel, who did not understand the question. "What will it be?" "Why," said Grandma, "your birthday." "No," said Mabel. "How old shall I be tomorrow, Grandma?" "What?" don't you remember why tomorrow you'll be six years old really cried mabel dear me why grandma i thought that i should feel so different when i grew up but i don't i feel just the same as i did when i was only a little girl grandma smiled that isn't so strange mabel she said do you know i am more than sixty years old and i think i feel just the same as when i was only a little girl but we must do something for your birthday because you have been so good and thoughtful all the year what would you like best oh let me see why i should like best of all to have a party you know i've never had a party and now that i'm real old i think i ought to have one let me have a birthday party will you grandma a birthday party said grandma well i should be very glad to let you have one only you don't know enough children about here and there isn't time to send out invitations to your cousins because they live so far away you see there are no children of your own age near by except walter and the farmer's little daughter and jack who lives over the hill that wouldn't be enough no i'm afraid you'll have to think of something else mabel went away and sat in the window for a while thinking pretty soon she came running back oh grandma she cried i've got a perfectly lovely idea i can have the party after all why how so mabel asked grandma what kind of party can you have an animal party cried mabel her eyes sparkling it will be such fun a what asked grandma an animal party i'll ask all the animals i know and get them all together in the grove in front of the house and give them a nice dinner just as though they were children won't that be splendid grandma laughed well mabel she said after a moment you are really a very original little girl now what animals would you ask oh let me see there are our own animals first of all there's rex and towser and the goat if he will be very good and the gray rat under the pump they can all come and help receive the other animals with me then i'll ask the frogs from the bridge and the mooly cow and the kitty cat and the little pig won't it be fun getting them all together yes it will be very droll said grandma who was much amused at the idea then mabel thought a little and hesitated grandma she said well mabel there's one more animal that i'd like to ask only only i don't quite know what you'll think about it when i tell you why what animal is that mabel i think you've mentioned all the animals that you know you surely aren't going to ask the cross dog no said mabel shaking her head it isn't the cross dog then what animal is it well said mabel slowly it's it's a wolf what gasped grandma her eyes opening very wide a wolf what on earth do you mean mabel why a wolf eats little girls a wolf is a terrible wild beast oh no grandma said mabel this is a good wolf and he wouldn't hurt anybody i've known him some time only i didn't want to say anything to you about him because i knew that you'd be afraid but please let me ask him because he's one of my best friends grandma said nothing for a long time but looked at mabel very intently finally she said mabel it seems to me that you are a very strange little girl and that things happen to you in very curious ways i have thought so for a good while only i didn't know how to explain it and i don't know now i remember how you tamed rex and i believe that you can do things that no one else can do if you ask the wolf i feel that you will be safe where any other little girl would be in great danger and so i shall not forbid your doing it but i shall stay in the house myself for i am afraid of wolves and walter must stay in too i will look out of the window and watch everything that goes on some day perhaps I may understand it all but i certainly don't now then grandma took her work basket and went upstairs to her room mabel clapped her hands and ran down to the barn 
where rex was standing all saddled and ready for her morning ride mabel told him about the party and that she was going to invite the other animals so when she had climbed up on his back they went down the road first of all to see the frogs at the bridge mabel invited all of them but after the frogs had talked it all over they thought that the five baby frogs were too small to go to parties yet and so as they could not be left alone the mamma frog would have to stay with them so the papa frog said that he would be the one to come to the party next mabel asked the mooly cow and the kitty cat and finally the little pig they all promised to come then mabel rode into the woods and stopped in the darkest part and whistled the call pretty soon she heard an answer and the good wolf appeared among the bushes wolf said mabel i want you to come to my birthday party tomorrow afternoon i'm going to have a goat a pig a mooly cow a kitty cat a rat and a frog ha said the wolf licking his chops that'll be good eating yes i'll come no no cried mabel i didn't mean that you mustn't eat them because they're my company oh said the wolf looking rather disappointed i didn't know yes said mabel they're my company you'll have lots of meat to eat but you must promise to be very very good and look as pleasant as pie and not growl once will you all right said the wolf the other animals are coming at about half past two said mabel but i want you to come at three o'clock what does that mean growled the wolf what's three o'clock oh wolf cried mabel don't you know how to tell time yet you ought to be ashamed of yourself and such a big wolf too well i'll tell you in another way when you hear the big bell in the church steeple across the fields go boom 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 tomorrow then you come as quick as you can to the party it's in the grove in front of my house now don't forget wolf will you wolf no i won't forget said the good wolf and mabel rode home at a gallop they're all coming grandma said mabel gaily as she clattered into the yard every one of them and is the wolf coming asked grandma in an anxious voice oh yes he'll be here and mabel went on to the barn grandma wondered more than ever the next day at two o'clock mabel had made all her plans for the party and was being dressed in her best party dress she had her hair curled in long ringlets all about her merry little face and grandma fastened a rosebud at the side of her head she wore a light blue silk with knots of ribbon neat little shoes with tiny silver buckles and a big lace collar fastened by a dainty pearl pin around her neck was a string of pearl beads that uncle robert had brought her from rome she was as pretty as any picture when she went out into the grove after looking at the nice things that she had got together for the animals to eat she stood in the center of the grove in the shade of a big elm tree all ready for company to come first of all came rex trotting down from the stable john had curried and brushed him till he was as glossy as satin ah good afternoon rex said mabel cordially i'm so glad you've come early for i want you to receive with me stand right here beside me rex neighed politely and did as she asked scarcely had he taken his place when towser trotted in with his tail in the air mabel shook his paw and put him at her left next came the goat and soon after the gray rat the rat looked a little uneasy being so far from its home under the pump and seemed a little afraid of towser but mabel was so friendly as to put it quite at ease in a minute then a sound of heavy steps was heard in the road and presently the mooly cow walked in swishing off flies with her tail she knew rex and towser and after being introduced to the other animals went up and stood by rex who was about her own size next the kitty cat pattered in she had washed her face and paws till they were beautifully clean and she wore a pink ribbon around her neck she looked rather hard at the rat for a moment but then went over by towser and sat down by his side not long after they heard a sharp trot and the little pig ambled in he was as clean as he could be and his tail was curled up tight over his back in his best party style he went up to the goat and began to talk to him about the weather presently a sort of hippity hop was heard and the green frog appeared his back shining in the sun mabel shook his damp claw and talked with him a moment and then gave him a place next to the gray rat all the animals were now paired off and were talking in a lively way all of them having a splendid time it was nearly three o'clock mabel looked down the road and then raised her little hand to show the animals that she had something to say to them they all stopped talking to listen animals she said i think i ought to tell you that there is one other animal coming who will be here in a minute 
I want to tell you about him now so that you'll not be a bit afraid when you see him. He is an old friend of mine, and you may be sure that he will be very, very good, so you needn't worry about him. The animals all pricked up their ears and looked interested. Yes, added Mabel, he will be here in a minute, and I will tell you who he is. He is a wolf. The animals gave a big jump and looked greatly frightened, all except Rex and Towser. Now, mind, said Mabel, he is a good wolf and won't hurt any of you. I think I hear him coming now. Sure enough, the sound of footsteps was heard on the road. All the animals except Rex and Towser were very nervous. Here he is, cried Mabel as she went forward to the opening in the grove. And just at that moment, the great wolf came, moving through the grass in plain sight. The animals stared at him as hard as they could. Most of them had never seen a wolf before, and their hearts beat very fast. He seemed enormous as he walked into the grove. His great thick legs, his big head and jaws, his sharp claws, his big eyes, all looked fearful to them at first. "'Good afternoon, wolf,' said Mabel. "'You are just in time, and we are all very glad to see you. "'You know Rex and Towser. "'Let me introduce you to the other animals. "'This is the gray rat. "'This is the frog. "'Here's the mooly cow and the kitty cat. "'And this is the little pig. "'I think you have met the goat before.' The goat ducked his head and looked embarrassed. He would have liked to run away, but the wolf looked so pleasant that he felt better in a minute. All the animals noted how politely the wolf smiled and bowed when he was introduced to them. Now, said Mabel, as you are all here, I will have refreshment served. Towser, will you please go over to the kitchen steps and bring the basket to me in your mouth? In a few minutes, Towser was back again, carrying the basket which Mabel had very carefully got ready that morning. She took it from him and opened the cover. The animals all looked interested. First, she took something out for the wolf, because she thought it just as well to give him something to do. So she handed him a great roast beef bone with about two pounds of beef on it, almost raw. He was so glad to get it that he gave a big growl of joy. The animals all jumped. Then she took out some toasted cheese for the gray rat, a package of dried flies for the frog, and some chop bones for Towser. The goat had three apples in a paper bag. He ate the bag off very carefully first, and then began on the apples. Then she gave the cow four large turnips and brought out a bag of oats for Rex. At the bottom of the basket was a large square of pig cake that she had cooked herself for the little pig. It was made of bran and potato peelings mixed up together, and was stuck full of horse chestnuts, which pigs liked as much as children do plums in a pudding. When the animals had had their food given them, they all fell to eating as fast as they could. They munched and chewed and nibbled, stopping now and then to chat. And Mabel was delighted to see that they were having a splendid time, all except the frog. He seemed to be uneasy. He hitched his shoulders up and rolled his eyes, and finally he stopped eating altogether, though he had only half finished his dried flies. Mabel went up to him to see what was the matter. Then she noticed that his skin had a curious cracked look, and that its green color had grown very dim. "'What's the matter, frog?' she asked softly so that no one could hear. The frog wriggled uneasily and shifted about on his forepaws and then croaked out, "'No water!' Mabel understood in a minute. She knew that he was not used to being out of the water for so long a time, and she saw that the skin was getting parched and dry on his back. She looked around. All the animals were busy eating and talking. "'Come,' she said. "'I'll give you some water.' Then she took him quickly up in her hands and slipped away with him to the house. She carried him upstairs very carefully into the bathroom, where there was a fine big tub lined with porcelain. The frog looked into it eagerly and then groaned. No water, croaked he. Oh, but there will be water, said Mabel. I can have the tub full of it in a minute. The frog looked doubtful. He did not see how she could fill the tub with water when there was no water there. He croaked sorrowfully. Now, see, said Mabel, putting one hand on the faucet. The frog looked. She turned the handle and swish! A great stream of cold water began pouring into the bathtub. The frog was so surprised that he nearly fell out of her hand. Do you see that? said Mabel, laughing. The frog thought that it was magic. Pretty soon the tub was half full. Jump! said Mabel. The frog gathered up his hind legs and gave a jump. Plunk! Splash! Down into the bathtub. Oh, how good the cool water felt to him! He swam about, sometimes sinking to the bottom, and sometimes floating on the top, as happy as if he were in his own brook. 
when he had had a good swim mabel lifted him out his skin all glistening and shiny with the water that dripped from his back and carried him carefully in a soap dish back to the grove then he croaked in a contented sort of way and nestled down in the grass to eat the rest of his dried flies with a splendid appetite the animals were now as much at home as could be they walked about chatting together and they were no longer afraid of the good wolf they were even glad that he had come because now they could tell all their friends how they had seen a real live wolf and how they had heard him talk the little pig went up close to the wolf and walked all around him looking at him very carefully and the gray rat even went up behind him and touched his hind paw so as to be able to say that it had actually felt of a wolf about five o'clock the muley cow noticed that the sun was going down and knew that it was time for her to go home and be milked so she went up to mabel and told her how she had enjoyed the party and said good-bye next the little pig left then the frog then the kitty cat and last the wolf mabel's own animals then went to the back yard rex to his stable towser to his doghouse the goat to the orchard and the gray rat to the pump they had all had a splendid time and so had mabel she picked up the basket and went back to the house with a sigh of satisfaction i think i've had a lovely party she said to grandma as she went in at the door yes i really think you have said grandma who had watched the whole affair rather anxiously from an upstairs window End of chapter eight chapter nine of the adventures of mabel by harry peck this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the tricks of the bad wolf down in the woods where the good wolf lived there also lived a bad wolf he was a long lanky hungry-looking animal with mangy fur and, and great jagged yellow teeth he seldom came out in the daytime but slept from sunrise till sunset in a dark den where he had one small cub when it grew dark the bad wolf would come slinking out of the den and go prowling around in the night looking for little rabbits that were asleep in their burrows when he found them he would break their necks and carry them back to his den to eat he did not like the good wolf and the good wolf did not like him though they were fairly polite to each other when they met the day after mabel's animal party just at sunset the good wolf was walking past the bad wolf's den when the bad wolf looked out and saw him going by hello growled the bad wolf i heard a funny thing about you last night the fox told me that he saw you out in the road near a house in the daytime yes said the good wolf that's so i went into the yard of the house too what cried the bad wolf into the yard did anyone see you why yes said the good wolf carelessly the little girl who lives there saw me and came out where i was really said the bad wolf who was greatly interested and did you eat her up aha i wish i could get a little girl to eat my brother once caught a little girl and ate her and he said that she was the tenderest bit of food that he had ever had in his life maybe you've got a little piece of her left eh if you have you might give me just a taste you know no said the good wolf shortly i didn't eat her no why not what a stupid thing well said the good wolf you see she knows the call oh said the bad wolf i wonder how she learned it i don't know answered the good wolf but anyhow i wouldn't touch her for she's a dear little thing pooh sneered the bad wolf you're no kind of a wolf to talk like that was there anything else to eat there yes said the good wolf there were lots of animals a horse a cow a dog a pig and a goat besides some small animals well of course you killed them cried the bad wolf what a lot of meat you must have now no said the good wolf i didn't touch one of them you see the little girl made me promise not to ugh snarled the bad wolf you're a regular fool wolf the idea of not killing them just because the little girl asked you not to ugh don't call me any names said the good wolf and he bristled up the hair on his neck and showed his long white teeth the bad wolf felt afraid oh i'll take it back he said hastily i didn't mean anything but where do these animals live i don't know where most of them live said the good wolf but the horse the dog and the goat stay on the place where the little girl lives not that it's any of your business he added roughly ho said the bad wolf sulkily you needn't be so cross about it but the good wolf didn't want to listen to the bad wolf any longer 
so he turned his back on him and trotted off through the underbrush the bad wolf watched him till he was lost to sight in the gathering darkness hateful beast snarled he i'd like to stick my teeth in his throat then he went back into his den and lay down on his bed of dried leaves to wait till it should be really dark as he lay there he thought over all that he had learned from the good wolf he remembered how the good wolf had said that the large animals lived in the yard at mabel's and he wondered whether he might not be able to creep in there and get one of them he did not think much about killing a horse because he was afraid of being kicked by his hoofs nor did he like dog meat but he thought of the goat and the more he thought the more he felt that a goat would be very good eating for himself and his cub a whole goat would last them for at least a week finally he couldn't stand it any longer i'll do it he said to himself he slipped out of the den in the darkness and prowled around until he found the fox he asked the fox where the house was at which the good wolf had been the day before and the fox told him then the bad wolf went out into the bushes and sharpened up his teeth on a long flint stone and about midnight he stole out of the woods into the road and went stealthily along it over the bridge where the frogs lived past the cross dogs's house and finally came to mabel's front gate he raised the latch with his nose and went into the yard gliding around to the back of the house the moon was not shining but the sky was full of stars so that the night was not so very dark as the bad wolf peered about he saw the goat lying fast asleep near the barn the wolf slid along in the grass and got ready to make a leap at the goat and catch him by the throat so as to choke him and keep him from making a noise he glared at the poor sleeping goat so hard that he didn't notice towser who lay in his doghouse not far away with his head toward the door towser was not asleep for the mosquitoes had been troubling him a good deal and his eyes were still open all of a sudden he saw a great black body gliding across the yard toward the place where the goat lay sleeping in a minute he was wide awake and three sniffs of his nose told him that the creature stealing into the yard was a wolf towser was a large dog but he was not so large as a wolf nor so strong yet he was very brave he did not stop to think whether or not he could beat a wolf he was ready to fight at any time and now he was glad to think that he had not been asleep he rose softly in his doghouse and stood all ready to spring watching the movements of the bad wolf and opening his mouth to bite him the bad wolf was now only about six feet from the goat in a minute more he would have rushed upon him when towser gave a fearful yell and leaped like a streak of lightning right on top of the wolf and buried his teeth in the wolf's back now wicked wolves like wicked men are apt to be cowards and towser's rush was so sudden that the bad wolf was frightened half to death he didn't know whether it was a dog or a lion and he didn't wait to see but gave one awful howl and turned and ran out of the yard as hard as he could go as he went out of the gate he scraped towser off his back and then ran down the road toward the woods howling at the top of his voice the farmer happened to be sitting up late that night mending a harness and he heard the howls of the bad wolf long before he reached the house a moment later looking out of the window the farmer saw a great black animal running down the road ha said the farmer i'll get my gun and just pepper him so he snatched his shotgun down from the wall and poked it out of the window bang went the shotgun just as the wolf was passing the house and it filled his skin full of shot it was a bird shot and not very large so that it did not kill him but it stung him fearfully and he gave a yell ten times as loud as before when he reached the woods he dashed into his den and rolled on the leaves in pain rubbing his sides with his paws and grunting and snarling what's the matter cried his little wolf cub waking up and running over to him get along with you snarled the bad wolf cuffing him over the head and driving him back to his corner of the den all the next day he lay on his leaves and grunted and moaned the good wolf who had heard all about it from the fox came in pretending that he had heard nothing good morning said he why what's the matter you don't look well no said the bad wolf who did not want any one to know what had happened i i i had a fall last night of a high fence and bruised my back curious thing said the good wolf why your back looks as though it's full of little holes ugh grunted the bad wolf yes i fell down into a lot of briar bushes and the thorns stuck into me oh said the good wolf smiling then if i were you 
I shouldn't walk on fences. Wolves generally don't, you know. The bad wolf lay there all day in a very unhappy state of mind, slowly picking out the shot from his skin with his teeth and rubbing his wounds with a rattlesnake oil, which is the great medicine for wolves. He thought a good deal about what had happened, and he felt a dreadful hate for the farmer. I wasn't doing anything to him, thought the bad wolf. What did he want to shoot at me for? I'll get even with him some day. So he thought and thought and thought, until he was simply wild with hate, and he said to himself that as soon as he was well, he would do something to punish the farmer. The next night the shot holes were beginning to heal up, so he crept out of his den once more and caught a rabbit. After he had eaten it, he went through the fields near the farmer's house and prowled around there in the dark a long while. He did this every night for a week, and in that time he found out some things that interested him very much. One was that the farmer had a little daughter. The other was that in the warm summer weather, many of the windows of the house were left open all night long. The bad wolf thought over these things a great deal. If he could only get into the house some night through the windows, he could carry off the little girl to his den and eat her. He had always wanted to eat a little girl, and besides, to do this would punish the farmer worse than anything that he could do. But he was too much of a coward to try such a thing all alone. He was dreadfully afraid of the shotgun, and so he said to himself that he would get some other animal to fight the farmer, while he himself caught the little girl. He was very mean in this, for he rather hoped that the farmer would kill the other animal, while the little girl was being carried off. If he does, said the bad wolf to himself, then I can have the whole of the little girl for my own eating. So he went about, looking for someone to help him. He knew that the good wolf would not have anything to do with such a plan. So he went first to the brown bear, who lived among the rocks in the middle of the woods. But the brown bear, as soon as he heard of it, grew very angry with the bad wolf and struck him a blow with his big paw that knocked him head over heels. Then he tried the wild cat that lived in a great beech tree near the edge of the woods. But the wild cat did not like the bad wolf and told him so. You are a thief and a coward, said the wild cat, and you only want to get me into trouble so that you may have something to eat for yourself. Go on, or I'll claw your fur off. So the bad wolf had to give up the idea of getting help from any of the animals that he knew. Yet he would not give up his plan, and at last he became so set upon it that he decided to do a very desperate thing. I'll go to the red wolves in the lonely forest, said he. Now the red wolves were wolves that had nothing to do with the wolves that were black. They were much bigger and fiercer, and usually hunted in packs, so that even men with guns never liked to meet them. They lived in a great forest called the Lonely Forest, about twenty miles away from the woods, where the bad wolf's den was. The lonely forest was as dark as night, even in the daytime, for the vines grew all over the tops of the trees and shut out the light, and there were great marshes and black pools in it, and gloomy caverns and huge dark dens, where the red wolves prowled all day and night. It was a fearful place, and if the bad wolf had not been very wicked and very revengeful, he would never have thought of going there for help against the farmer. Nevertheless, he did make up his mind to visit the lonely forest. So one night after midnight, he set out on his journey and reached the lonely forest just at daybreak. When he crept into its gloomy shadows and saw how dark and dreadful it looked, he shivered with fear, but he had gone too far to stop. So he tried to look brave as he slunk along through the thick fern and the matted ivy that tangled his feet at every step. He had gone about half a mile and was in the very darkest and gloomiest part. Then all of a sudden he heard a low growl that made his blood run cold. A moment later, a great head was thrust out of a thicket, and two red eyeballs glared at him like coals of fire. It was an enormous wolf that squatted there as a sort of sentinel. What do you mean, said the red wolf in a terrible voice, by coming into the lonely forest, you a black wolf whom we tear in pieces whenever we find him? The bad wolf's voice trembled as he answered. I come as a friend he said, and I wish to do you a favor. If you will let me tell you what I want, it will bring you meat for days. Ugh, growled the red wolf. We ask no favors of the black wolves. They are weak and cowardly, but come, follow me. The red wolf led the way through the forest, and the black wolf followed him. He was sorry enough now to think that he had ever come to this fearful place. He fancied that perhaps the red wolf was only leading him to some dark cavern to be torn in pieces and eaten. 
his legs trembled so that he could scarcely walk but it was now too late to turn back he must go on presently the red wolf turned into a gloomy sort of glade and came to an open place where the ground was cleared of bushes and was perfectly level great rocks rose on three sides of it and walled it in like a room at the end was a spring of water by which lay three wolves one in the middle was the biggest wolf that the bad wolf had ever seen he was covered with shaggy red hair so long that it swept the ground and on top of his head was a thick tuft of fur almost as red as fire he was a terrible-looking creature the two wolves that sat on each side of him were not so large but they were strong and fierce-looking one of them was almost gray the wolf with the tuft on his head was the king of the red wolves and the other two were his messengers when the king saw the bad wolf coming up with the guide he sat up on his haunches what have you there he asked in a voice that made the rocks sing a black wolf ha why did you not kill him and bring his body here he asked to speak with you said the guide bowing low and rubbing his nose on the ground he promises much meat if you will hear him speak on black wolf commanded the king but use few words i like not the voice of the black wolves great king of the red wolves said the bad wolf i come to offer you a rare hunt near the woods where i live stands the house of a man a farmer in it live the farmer and his wife and his little girl at night they do not close their windows but leave them open send one or two of your best fighters with me and i will lead them to this house they can enter in the night and kill the farmer and his wife and his little girl good eating for you o king of the red wolves ha growled the king why do you come here to tell me this and why do you not keep this eating for your own kind you a black wolf and no friend to us you mean some trick some treachery ha huh? no king of the red wolves said the bad wolf i mean no trick i will speak the truth i hate the farmer and i wish him eaten but i'm not strong enough to enter and to fight with him it is you and your wolves who are strong and brave good said the king i understand i will give you the two you ask but you are not to expect for any portion of the meat yourself yours shall be all the revenge and ours shall be all the meat the bad wolf looked crestfallen at this but he thought to himself aha while they are fighting i'll make sure of the little girl and slip away with her but he said aloud i agree send with me two of your wolves the king spoke to his messengers go you he said with the black wolf and hunt as he shall direct and do you go too he said turning to the guide there is no need of three said the bad wolf why do you send him also to watch you said the king in a terrible voice and if he find you playing any treacherous trick he shall tear you in pieces and drink your blood the bad wolf trembled i i am a faithful ally said he i i play no tricks you had better not growled the king now go these wolves will stay with you here till nightfall and then all of you can go forth on the hunt for man's meat the three wolves then led the bad wolf back to a great dark cave whose sides were slimy with toadstools and kept him there all day they gave him a piece of bull meat for his dinner and some water in a turtle shell when it was nearly night they called him and the four set out together on their long run across the open fields the great wolf ran on one side of the bad wolf the other messenger on the other the guide followed close behind on and on and on they went trotting swiftly over hill and dale through bushes and briars past groves and swamps swimming through rivers and wading through brooks at about midnight they passed around the bad wolf's woods and came to the farmer's yard there said the bad wolf pointing there's the house where the farmer lives the lights in the house were all out but the starlight showed where it was the four wolves crept up to the house and then lay down for a while to rest a little after their long run and get their breath for the fight now it happened that on this particular evening a strong breeze was blowing so that the night was very cool and the farmer had shut the lower windows of the house and locked them fast consequently when the four wolves had got their breath and had crawled stealthily up to the house they found no opening within their reach the red wolves turned fiercely on the bad wolf you have lied to us snarled they you have lied to us and you shall die 
no no cried the bad wolf i told you the truth only it is different somehow to-night but see see there is an upper window open sure enough an upper window on the second floor was still unfastened the reason of it was that the farmer after undressing himself and putting out the lights had felt like smoking his pipe before going to bed and was sitting in his chair by the window at that very moment but of course the wolves did not know this they only saw that the window was open it's very high said the gray wolf we can never jump so high as that no said the guide but we must get in let us make a pile of wolves i will stand at the bottom the black wolf here can climb on my back and you two can get up on him and the top wolf can easily climb into the window yes said the gray wolf but there will then be only one to fight the man is that enough there will be no fight said the guide they're all asleep do you slip softly in and find their sleeping room and kill them while they sleep one good bite in the throat for each will be enough come make the pile as he spoke the guide took his place under the window and the bad wolf tried to climb upon his back but he was clumsy and the strange thing that he was doing so excited him that he could scarcely keep his balance upon the red wolf he had to try it several times the other wolves helped him and when he showed himself so awkward they growled at him and threatened him with their teeth now the farmer as he sat inside the room smoking heard the growls and the scuffling of paws on the ground below and he leaned over very cautiously and looked out there were four great wolves right under the window jiminy said the farmer to himself what's all this the farmer had been a great hunter when he was a young man and he knew in a minute that the wolves were red wolves strong and fierce and not cowardly like most of the black wolves he knew too that they had come to enter his house and to kill him and his wife and his little girl he could not at first see how they expected to get in but a second peep showed him their plan that they were going to climb up upon each other's backs to the open window jiminy said the farmer again the pesky critters i'll pepper their hides so he took down his gun and his powder horn and began to load he put in a tremendous charge of powder and then felt for his bag of bullets all of a sudden he remembered that it was empty jiminy he said i'll have to use shot but when he took up his shot pouch he found that he had no shot left either not even bird shot he was greatly startled he put his gun down and took another peep out of the window by this time three of the wolves had got into place the guide on the ground the bad wolf next and one of the messengers on his back in a few minutes more the gray wolf would be climbing into the window the farmer thought hard an idea came into his head hurrah he said under his breath i'll fix em he remembered that the next day was his wife's washing day and that everything in the kitchen was ready for it he hurried downstairs in his bare feet to the basement there on the big stove was a great copper cauldron full of hot water all ready for the morning's wash it held about eight gallons of water all steaming and scalding hot aha cried the farmer joyfully we'll have a wolf wash he lifted the cauldron off the fire by the handle and carried it quickly up the stairs to the open window and rested it on the sill just at that moment the huge head of the gray wolf appeared at the opening his jaws wide open his teeth gleaming and his eyes glaring in the darkness take that roared the farmer and he upset the whole cauldron out of the window a perfect cataract of scalding water went sizzling right into the face of the gray wolf and down the backs of the other wolves below every drop was as hot as a coal of fire and burned and scalded straight through their fur the four wolves gave a horrible yell of pain and the whole pile of them tumbled to the ground writhing and squirming and howling just then the farmer who was watching them remembered something he turned back into the room struck a match and took down from the shelf a paper of long tacks why didn't i think of this before he said he picked up his gun and poured the whole paper of tacks into the gun barrel and then rammed down a piece of paper after it then he went to the window and took aim at the four wolves that were writhing in a solid mass below bang went the gun with a great spirit of fire and in half a second about a thousand tacks were sticking all over the skins of the wolves like cloves in a pudding this was more than they could stand with loud howls they rushed across the lawn and tore down the road as fast as their legs could carry them their skins burned so from the scalding water that when they reached the brook where the frogs lived they jumped right into it and lay down in the cool water oh how good it felt but the moment the red wolves felt a little better they all three leaped upon the bad wolf 
who had brought them into so much trouble they seized him by the neck and held him under the water till they thought he was drowned and all the while biting him and snapping great pieces out of his back when they supposed that he was dead they came out of the brook and hurried home to the lonely forest for they knew that it would be daylight very soon and that if they should be seen parties of men would come out with guns and shoot them the bad wolf was not dead but he was almost dead and when he crawled out of the brook it took him all the rest of the night to hobble back to his den his ears were bitten off big strips of fur had been scalded out by the hot water and his skin was full of tacks the next morning he lay on his bed of leaves groaning when the good wolf happened along and came in the fox had told him something of what had happened good morning he said to the bad wolf why what's the matter you don't seem well the bad wolf was too miserable to think of any new excuse so he said i i i fell off a fence and hurt my back what again said the good wolf with a grin well you look as though when you fell you'd fallen into a sausage chopper and he went away laughing End of chapter 9chapter ten of the adventures of mabel by harry peck this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the giant's castle for a long time mabel always took the same morning ride going along the straight road that led to the little pig's red house because she was afraid that she might get lost if she tried any new and unknown roads but when she found that she was six years old she felt that she could do things that she had never done before and besides she was growing tired of always riding over the same road and seeing the same things every day so one beautiful morning she made up her mind that she would take a ride in a different direction and try to see some parts of the country that she had never seen before i'm going a different way this morning grandma she said as she went out of the house there's a road that goes to the left after you pass the kitty cats and i'm going to ride that way very well said grandma only don't go too far be back to luncheon oh i'll be back in time said mabel as she went to the barn and climbed on rex's back for her new ride down the road she trotted past the cross dogs's house and over the bridge where the frogs lived and past the mooley cows and the kitty cats till she came to the road that branched off to the left mabel pulled on the left rein and rex much to his surprise turned into the new course it was a winding road going in and out of groves and small woods and passing between meadows that were bright with flowers mabel was so pleased with the change from the old sights that she went farther and farther now making rex trot and now making him gallop the sun shone bright the air was soft and warm and both mabel and rex enjoyed every minute of the time at last as she came out of a dense grove mabel saw before her a great broad river shining like silver in the sunlight over it was a splendid stone bridge she had never seen a river before and she rode quickly upon the bridge and looked up and down the vast stream that flowed along with a million ripples among the arches then she crossed it and came to a road wider than any road she had ever seen before and passing between fields fenced with stone each field was so large that she could scarcely see the fences on the other side and here and there she saw men working dressed in red from head to foot how strange said mabel to herself it's like a picture book on she rode and still she saw those great wide fields and groups of men in red at last she found three or four of the men working near the fence by the side of the road so she went up to them and spoke to them good morning men she said who owns all these great fields the men looked at her and laughed don't you know asked one of them why the giant owns them mabel laughed in her turn they're making fun of me said she to rex and rode on pretty soon she found some more men near the roadside all dressed in red like the others and she stopped and spoke to them also who owns these fields she asked and the men answered with a look of surprise why the giant owns them of course dear me said mabel do they really mean it and then she asked what's the giant's name please ha ha laughed the men where have you been that you don't know about the giant his name is cormoran and he lives in the castle over the hill really said mabel and why do you all dress in red oh because red is the giant's favorite color said they and all his people dress in red well well said mabel where did you say his castle is 
straight ahead of you over the hill said they and is he a good giant asked mabel curiously well pretty good said one of the men rather doubtfully when he ain't put out he's pretty good but when he don't feel just right we have to get out of his way i can tell you mabel thought a moment anyway she said i'll just ride up to the top of the hill and take a peek nobody'll notice me and i'd love to see a giant's castle just for once so she rode up the steep hill and when she reached the very top she gave a cry of wonder there beneath her in a beautiful green valley was an immense great castle so enormous that it seemed like a whole city it was built of gray stone and its roofs were peaked and covered with thick gold leaf so that they glittered in the sunlight immense towers each one as big as ten church steeples rose above the roofs and on the central tower there floated an enormous red flag isn't it wonderful cried mabel as she looked there was no one in sight anywhere and mabel was so astonished by the vast size of the castle that she forgot to be afraid and she began to want to ride down the hill so as to see everything better i'll just go up to the front gate said mabel to herself if i see anyone coming out i can turn around and make rex gallop away quick i'll do it so down she rode into the valley looking at the castle all the time with her mouth wide open as she came nearer and nearer to it she saw how large the blocks of stone were and how immense the windows were and she wondered more and more it was stranger than anything in her picture books presently she reached the front entrance and found a double door of iron studded with brass nails and with great spikes on the top of it the door was almost as high as an ordinary house and mabel wondered how any one could be strong enough to push it open she noticed that the lock was bigger than her whole body and the keyhole wide enough for her to put her head in i wonder if i could peep through the cracks in the door said mabel to herself and she was making rex go nearer to the entrance when all of a sudden the great door flew wide open and a man rushed out all dressed in red from head to foot mabel gave a scream and tried to make rex gallop off but as soon as the man saw her he gave a jump and caught at the bridle Rah! he said what luck here's one now mabel was terribly frightened let me go let me go she cried trying to pull the reins out of the man's hand no no don't go he said please don't go don't be afraid nobody's going to hurt you mabel looked at him carefully he had a good face and he did not seem like a cruel man don't go he repeated what do you want asked mabel why i want you to come inside the castle for a little while it won't do you any harm if you don't come why i shall be eaten up by the giant at sundown how do you mean asked mabel well i'll tell you said the man you see the giant's little girl has been dreadfully sick for a long time and she's just getting better but she can't go out yet and has to lie on the sofa of the nursery all day long she's terribly lonely without anyone to play with and the giant thinks she'd get well faster if she could be amused so he's just sent me out this morning to find a playmate for her and said that if i didn't bring one back today he'd eat me up now you're just what i want a nice good-looking little girl so please come in and play with her a while won't you oh said mabel who was sorry for the man i'd like to oblige you but i'm afraid of the giant pooh said the man if you'll play with his little girl he'll be as good as can be besides you won't be likely to see him anyhow will you come in and can i come away again when i want to asked mabel oh yes you just play a little while and then say you'll come back again some other day and they'll let you out mabel hesitated she was very curious to see the inside of the castle but she still felt a little afraid what is the little girl's name she asked elsie said the man and she's a real pleasant little girl too she'll be awfully glad to see you well said mabel slowly i'll come in if you're sure they'll let me out as soon as i want to leave oh yes said the man who looked very happy now that he saw mabel was going to go inside thank you very much little girl now i won't have to be eaten he went up to the great double door and pulled a chain clang clang went a big bell and the door flew wide open mabel looked in and saw a vast courtyard as large as a meadow it was paved with stone and the inner windows of the castle opened upon it on one side was a great inner doorway with stone steps a number of men dressed in red and looking like soldiers were standing about they carried spears and had iron hats on their heads the man led rex into the courtyard with mabel still seated in the saddle who comes here 
asked one of the spearmen in red a playmate for the little lady elsie said mabel's man the spearmen all bowed very low she is welcome said they all come take care of her horse said mabel's man while i show her up to the nursery so one of them lifted mabel off rex's back and another took rex by the head to lead him to the stable this way little girl said mabel's man and he started to show her toward the door on the right just at that moment a window above was opened with a loud bang mabel looked up and her heart nearly stopped beating for out of the window came an enormous face it was the giant his head was as large as a haystack and was fringed by a long red beard tufts of red hair stuck out under his helmet and his eyes were like great lamps as he looked down into the courtyard he opened his mouth and spoke and his voice was that like the roll of thunder what have you there he bellowed and mabel nearly fainted when she heard his tremendous voice a playmate for the little lady elsie answered mabel's man oh roared the giant and he smiled a mile six feet long he was evidently very much pleased good he continued show her up to the nursery and he banged the window down again and went away see said the man he's all right now he'll be pleased all the rest of the day come on they went in through the doorway where there was a tall flight of stairs each step was so high that mabel could not stretch her little legs up from one to the other but the man took her under the arms and boosted her a step at a time till at last they reached the top of the stairs where was a white enameled door the man knocked on it and blew a silver whistle come in said a loud voice inside the man pushed the door open and told mabel to go in she found herself in a long high room about the size of a small church it was a very pretty room it was papered in white and gold and carpeted with soft fleecy rugs and had a great many tall silvered vases here and there filled with big clusters of roses and pinks and at one end was a big bay window curtained with exquisite lace and rose-colored silk through which the sunlight streamed in and flooded the room with warmth and color at one side of the room was a sofa about as long as two ordinary beds with pillows of pale blue silk and a pretty spread of silk and lace there lay the giant's little girl looking eagerly toward her new playmate she was about eight feet tall being small for her age and she had dark hair and brown eyes her cheeks were pale but she had a beautiful face which lighted up as she saw mabel oh goody she said now i've got someone to play with but ain't you awfully little why you must be a dwarf no i'm not said mabel but you're awfully big why they said you're a little girl so i am said elsie but you see i'm a giant what's your name mabel and how old are you six said mabel proudly why so am i said elsie i was six last week come over here and i'll show you some of the toys that papa gave me on my birthday here's my doll and she pulled out a doll from under her pillow it was as large as mabel herself and here's my toy horse she said pulling out from behind her a wooden horse about the size of a shetland pony my what big toys said mabel oh do you think so asked elsie here's my tin soldiers here's my jack-in-a-box here's my new tea-set the tin soldiers were so heavy that mabel could not lift them the plates in the tea-set were as big around as the top of a table how funny said mabel laughing just then a loud rustling and flapping made mabel look behind her and then she noticed a sort of bird-cage as big as a chicken coop in it was a great yellow bird rustling its wings oh said mabel where did you get the eagle ha 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 laughed elsie that isn't an eagle that's my canary mabel laughed too it must be awfully queer to be a giant she said don't you feel too big sometimes oh dear no said elsie you see i was born big and i should think you'd feel much too little not a bit said mabel you see i was born little we'll have some candy said elsie my papa gave me a lot of it on my birthday but i can't eat any till i get well so i'll give you some she drew out a pasteboard box from under the sofa it was about the size of a packing box and when she took the lid off mabel saw that it was lined with lace paper elsie took out a great lump of something that was brown in color and set it on the floor beside mabel it came up to her knees what's that she said looking at it curiously ha ha laughed elsie why where have you been all your life didn't you ever see a chocolate cream drop gracious cried mabel is that a chocolate cream drop why just that one would last me for two weeks she tried to lift it up to her mouth to take a bite but it was too heavy 
then she got down on her knees and tried to bite a piece out of it but it was so big that she couldn't get hold of it with her teeth elsie looked on and laughed as though she would never stop i can't get any said mabel who had only succeeded in smearing the end of her nose with chocolate and i love chocolate cream drops too dear me said elsie there must be some way of doing it i know look in my toy box by the table and you'll find a toy axe mabel found the toy axe which was as large as an ordinary hatchet and with this she knelt down on the floor and began to chop the chocolate cream drop pretty soon she had chopped off some good-sized chunks small enough to be held in the hand they were delicious and she sat on the floor eating them while elsie shook with laughter at the idea of taking an axe to a chocolate cream drop just at that moment a noise was heard in the hall bump 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 making the very walls tremble what's that elsie asked mabel with her mouth full of chocolate cream oh that's my papa coming downstairs said elsie and sure enough a moment later the nursery door opened and cormoran strode into the room mabel knew that he would not do her any harm but still she could not help feeling a little startled at being so near to a giant he seemed bigger than ever in the small nursery he wore enormous jackboots and carried a long knife by his side as he came in he looked at the children when he saw the toys scattered over the floor and mabel eating the chocolate cream drop and when he noticed how elsie laughed and how bright her eyes were and how her pale cheeks were once more flushed with color his great face beamed with happiness and he smiled hugely having a good play are you he asked in his thunderous voice that's right play away i haven't seen you looking so gay in many a week elsie then turning to mabel he said you're a good little girl you must stay with us oh no i really can't stay cried mabel my grandma would be so frightened but i'll come back and play with elsie as often as you want for i love her and we're having splendid fun together well well said the giant i won't keep you only don't forget to come back every few days and when you get ready to go to-day just stop at my door on your way out and i'll give you something for a keepsake and with these words he went out of the nursery and shut the door the children played together a long while until mabel suddenly remembered that it must already be after her luncheon time so she told elsie that she would have to go well good-bye dear said elsie don't forget to come again soon and be sure you stop at my papa's door at the other end of the hall they kissed each other and elsie rang a bell for the man in red to show mabel the way out first he took her to the giant's den and knocked on the door come in said a great voice and the door opened and mabel found herself in the den it was the largest room she had ever seen the walls were hung with clubs of every kind plain clubs and spiked clubs and clubs with great knobs on them besides spears swords knives axes and pikes a long table was covered with books each one as large as a door mabel who had just learned to read a little spelled out the names on the backs of two of them the life of og and men i have eaten there were also a good many pictures on the walls showing other giants who were probably the relatives of cormoran well little girl said the giant kindly so you're going home are you i want to give you a little present so he drew out a large drawer in the table and told mabel to take anything she liked there were long strings of bright stones blue and red and white and even in the dark drawer they gleamed and shone as if they were darting sparks of fire each one was as big as a robin's egg have a necklace said the giant pulling out a dozen or more of them no thank you said mabel my grandma says that it isn't nice to wear glass ha 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 roared the giant bursting into laughter so loud that mabel stopped her ears up with her fingers he was greatly amused to hear mabel call the stones glass for they were really the largest and finest gems in the world sapphires and rubies and diamonds well then have a ring said he still chuckling and he showed her a box full of rings i'm afraid they're too large said mabel for the smallest was as big around as a hoople bless me said the giant so they are he seemed quite disturbed at not being able to give her anything finally an idea came into his head he took out a great coil of frosted gold wire and began to berate it into a belt he worked quickly and soon he had made a very quaint and curious band of an odd pattern there he said as he slipped it around her waist oh thank you cried mabel who was no longer afraid of him isn't that lovely good-bye good-bye said he don't forget to come again 
Abel went out into the hall, and the man in red helped her down the big steps into the courtyard. As she passed through the door, the great bell of the castle clanged, and the spearmen stood in line and saluted her. One of them brought out Rex, who had a fine dinner of giant oats. The man in red lifted Mabel to the saddle. The outer gate flew open. She waved her hand to the men and spoke to Rex, and away she galloped out into the road, never stopping until she had passed the stone bridge, the kitty cat's house, the mooly cows's, the frogs's bridge, and the cross dogs's, and come clattering into her own yard. It was already four o'clock, and Grandma had begun to fear that Mabel was lost. Why, where have you been, Mabel? asked she. You didn't come back to luncheon, and I was quite worried about you. Were you lost? Oh, no, said Mabel. But I've had such a good time that I forgot all about luncheon. You see, I went down a new road, and there I met a little girl and played with her in her own nursery. She is a very good little girl, Grandma, and I'm going back to see her before long. What is her name? asked Grandma. Oh, Elsie, answered Mabel. She, and she had lots of toys and candy and things. Just then Grandma noticed the golden belt that glittered in the sunlight around Mabel's waist. Why, Mabel, she cried, where did you get that belt? What a beautiful pattern, and it looks as bright and fine as real gold. Oh, said Mabel, the little girl's papa gave it to me. You see, the little girl has been sick and wanted someone to play with, so her papa was very glad that I came. Dear me, said Grandma, I wonder who these people are. But Mabel did not say anything about their being giants, for she knew that Grandma would be dreadfully frightened if she heard that her little girl had been to visit a giant's castle. End of chapter 10「Eleven of the Adventures of Mabel by Harry Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter number eleven The Brownie Jelly One day, about two o'clock in the afternoon, Mabel put on her sunbonnet and took a little basket and went down into the woods to pick blackberries. It was getting to be rather late in the summer, and the berries were not very plenty, so that she had to go a long way into the woods before she found any bushes that were filled. But at last she came upon a great thicket full of briars, but with bushes on which the ripe berries were so thick that she cried out with joy when she saw them. Behind the thicket rose an enormous rock, half hidden by vines and creepers. Mabel got down on her hands and knees, picking away as hard as she could, and when she had gathered all the berries on the outside of the thicket, she began to creep along the ground in the midst of the bushes, avoiding the sharp briars, and reaching up for the berries that hung above her head. Further and further she crept, like a little mouse in a haystack, and by the time she had crawled through to the rock her basket was nearly full. At this moment, however, she saw to her surprise that the base of the rock, which had been hidden by the bushes, was not solid, but that there was a large hole in it which seemed to have been hollowed out of the stone. It was an opening about half as high as Mabel herself, and appeared as though it led into a sort of dark tunnel in the rock. Well, said Mabel, that looks like a kind of cave. I wonder if it is. She peered into the hole, but it was too dark for her to see what was inside of it, so she thought that she would crawl in just a little way to find out how far into the rock it went. In she crept on her hands and knees, and as soon as she had got inside, she discovered that the hole, instead of growing smaller or coming to an end, was even larger than it had looked. She felt of the sides and of the top with her hands, and found that by crawling a little further, she could stand on her feet without touching the rock overhead. Dear me, she said, greatly excited, it's like a hall in a house. I wonder where it leads to. She thought at first that it might be the den of some wild animal. So she whistled the call two or three times, but got no answer. I'll go on, thought she. I can easily find my way out. For when she turned around, she could still see the mouth of the cave and the sunlight shining beyond it. So on she walked, putting her feet down very carefully at every step, for fear she should fall into some hole. And pretty soon she came to a sharp turn in the passageway, where she had to go around a corner. As soon as she had turned the corner, she found a very broad, high passage, and at the end of it a long ray of light, like a bright pencil, shone far out into the darkness. It seemed to come through a little hole in the rock at the end of the tunnel. What's that? thought Mabel. I'll walk very softly up to it and see. 
a dozen more steps brought her to the chink through which the light was streaming she groped about the wall with her little hands and found that it felt like a great stone door while the chink was exactly the shape of a keyhole as she stood there she could hear voices on the other side of the door and now and then the sound of laughter and the strains of gay music she was ever so curious and was just putting up her head to peek through the keyhole when all of a sudden she sneezed a loud long sneeze instantly even before she had stopped sneezing the door in front of her flew wide open a flood of brilliant light poured out into the dark tunnel and in the doorway mabel saw a funny little figure standing before her he had a queer peaked cap on his head and a comical merry look on his face and mabel knew at once that he was a brownie when the brownie saw her he looked very much surprised and then began to laugh gracious goodness cried he a little girl how in the world did you get here i crept through the bushes after berries said mabel who was very much amused by the brownies's looks and i found a big hole in the rock and followed it along until i reached this door well 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 said the brownie come in he stepped aside mabel walked through the doorway and he shut the door after her she found herself in a noble hall whose walls were panelled with silver and whose ceiling was carved out of solid gold here and there clusters of what looked like great pearls were embedded in the golden ceiling and from them shone the soft clear light that filled the hall with its radiance and gleamed on the silver panels and the yellow gold all about were easy chairs of some rich white stuff and huge cushions of velvet were placed along the sides of the hall on them were seated half a dozen brownies chattering away to each other while in the middle of the hall a number of them were playing tag and leapfrog now and then lively music could be heard played by a band of musicians whom mabel could not see when they saw mabel all the brownies stopped talking and playing and crowded about her with their bright little faces full of curiosity a little girl they all shouted how did you come here mabel told them all about it and as she told them they laughed and chuckled she looked at them very carefully all the while and she could remember having seen pictures of most of them in one of her books there was the soldier brownie and the sailor brownie the policeman brownie the dude brownie the chinese brownie the indian brownie and the irish brownie but there were many new brownies that she had never heard anything about when she had finished telling them how she had found her way into the cave they all laughed again and every one of them shook hands with her and told her to make herself at home sit down on the big cushion near the wall said the brownie who had opened the door for her i've got to go and tell the king about your being here and see what he has to say but i'll be back soon so have a good time with my brothers while i'm gone mabel sat down and watched them as they romped about playing all sorts of tricks on each other and laughing at every kind of joke while the music played the gayest tunes pretty soon a waiter brownie came up to mabel with a gold tray on which stood a silver jar it was open and was full of something amber colored in which there was a small gold spoon what's this asked mabel as she looked at it jelly said the waiter brownie taste it it's awfully good mabel took the golden spoon and put a little of the jelly in her mouth ah she said rolling up her eyes it was the most delicious morsel that she had ever tasted in her life it was like all the loveliest kinds of ice cream blended together with pounded almonds and chocolate and strawberries and it melted away on her tongue like honey ah said mabel again and she took the jar into her lap and began eating the jelly slowly to make it last as long as she could when she had finished she scraped the bottom and then gave a great sigh of satisfaction just at this moment the brownie whom she had first seen came back into the hall and beckoned to her the king wants to see you he said come with me and i'll show you the way he led her out through a short passage and into a room that was the most splendid room that she could ever have imagined it was not very large but the walls were encrusted with thousands of great uncut rubies of the richest red the ceiling was starred with diamonds and the floor was of beaten gold at one end of the room the brownie king was sitting on a low throne he was a jolly-looking old brownie dressed all in scarlet with a crown on the back of his head beside him was a pipe with a long stem encrusted with diamonds and on a table near him stood a large gold mug with a lid his brown eyes twinkled when he saw mabel aha little girl said he come in i want to see you for you're the only little girl who ever found her way to our house and no little girl will ever be able to do it again so i want you to have a good time while you're here 
and carry away many pleasant thoughts of the brownies did you enjoy yourself in the great hall oh yes king said mabel i had a splendid time there and some jelly what's your name dear asked the king mabel well mabel said he patting her on the head you must let me give you something to remember the brownies by then he turned to mabel's guide and continued show mabel into the treasure room and let her choose any one thing that she likes for a present to take home with her then he took a golden key from his belt and gave it to the brownie saying go with him mabel and select your present and when you have done so come back and say good-bye to me the brownie took the key from the king and bowed and then mabel followed him out of a, a second door they went through several long narrow halls and a dark passageway that twisted and turned in different directions till they came to a thick stone door with a big lock and having an iron ring on the outside here is the treasure room said the brownie as he thrust the king into the lock and turned it then he pulled the iron ring the door slowly opened and he and mabel went in mabel gave a cry of wonder and delight the treasure room was an immensely long hall filled with thousands of beautiful things piled up to the very ceiling great cases stood about crammed with everything that any one could ever want and there were also tables covered with all sorts of treasures toys picture books lovely dresses silk satins velvets mountains of candy of every kind and color knick-knacks paintings curious carvings bric-a-brac jewels and precious stones ornaments everything beautiful that any one could imagine all were in that wonderful room oh oh cried mabel again her eyes sparkling with delight what delicious things yes they are pretty said the brownie smiling at her excitement and you must choose something for yourself as a present from the king may i really choose anything i want asked mabel yes any one thing said the brownie what shall it be oh i must look around first said mabel and she began to move about slowly among the heaps of treasures piled up against the sides of the room were great bags of gold the brownie told her what was in them oh i don't want any gold said mabel carelessly and the brownie laughed a little to himself the first thing that she stopped to look at was a case filled with clusters of the most exquisite pearls strung into necklaces upon silver thread each pearl was as large as a pea and had a soft lustrous gleam that made the whole necklace look like a string of globed lamps turned low oh how pretty cried mabel they'd be just lovely to wear with my party dress i'll try one on so she tried one of the necklaces on i i think i'll take this said she all right said the brownie but just at that moment mabel's eyes caught sight of a dress hanging on a silver nail near by it was made of pale rose-colored silk covered with lace so fine that it looked as though it had been made by the fairies and tiny knots of rose-colored ribbon were fastened at the shoulders and the waist oh isn't it lovely cried mabel and it's just the right size for me may i take this instead of the necklace of course said the brownie mabel took the dress down from its nail and held it on her arm passing her fingers over the lace and smoothing out the bows i think i'll take this said she slowly but just then she heard the sound of the most beautiful music by her side and when she turned to look she found that it came from an ivory box it's a magic music box said the brownie it plays all the tunes in the world all you have to do is to pat the lid three times and say what you want it to play and it will play it till you pat it again it was a very small box but it played like a whole orchestra now softly and sweetly like a fairy lullaby and then full and strong like a great military band with drums and trumpets and cymbals and then again its music was like that of flutes and harps and violins oh that's what i want said mabel never mind the dress she raised the box from the table and patted it to make it stop and then she patted it again and told it to play the lizard's call all at once it began playing it first simply and then with all sorts of changes to the sound of little silver bells and tinkling triangles yes i'll take that said mabel and she was turning around to go when just behind her she saw what at first she took to be a little girl of about three years old sitting on a small velvet sofa why who's that gasped mabel greatly surprised that's a doll said brownie and i think you never saw one like it before it can talk and laugh and cry and walk can you talk asked mabel of the doll oh yes said the doll smiling i can say a hundred words 
dear me said mabel how strange she put the music box down and lifted the doll off the sofa and set it upon the floor it walked up and down two or three times and then said put me back please well i never said mabel there's a whole trunk of clothes that go with the doll said the brownie oh that's what i want said mabel would you like to go with me dolly yes indeed said the doll it's stupid sitting here all alone well said mabel i think i'll take you and then she was looking about for the trunk of clothes when down at the end of the hall she noticed for the first time a sort of house standing among a perfect forest of swings seesaws and runarounds why what's that she asked oh that's a doll house said the brownie want to see it yes said mabel and she hurried down to where it stood leaving the doll who called after her once or twice and then laughed mabel reached the doll house it was a real house with twelve rooms each one almost large enough for mabel herself to sit in the front of the house had real glass windows with lace curtains two front doors and a doorstep besides a little doorbell and the whole front swung open on hinges and showed the inside of the house when you rang the bell each of the twelve rooms was fully carpeted and furnished even to the pictures on the walls and the clocks on the mantels and the soap dish in the bathroom a bird cage with a canary that really sang hung in the sewing room there was a piano in the parlor and in the kitchen was a stove with a fire in it that blazed up when you touched a knob a pump in the sink pumped real water and when the fire in the stove was going real smoke came out of the chimneys at the top of the house the bedrooms had lovely little beds with pillows and pillow shams the dining room had a full set of dishes on the sideboard the garret was stored with trunks and curious things and the cellar had a coal bin and a woodpile just as in a real house oh that's the best yet cried mabel clapping her hands but it's so big that i couldn't carry it home oh yes you could said the brownie you press the little knob in the roof and the house shuts up by magic and makes a little package that you can carry in one hand and when you press the other knob on the doorstep it all opens out again just as you see it now well then this is what i will really take said mabel and she walked around the house looking at it from all sides as she went behind it to see if there was a back door she saw against the end of the treasure room a great pyramid of little silver jars each one having a gold spoon tied to it by a silver wire ah said mabel as she looked at the jars i know what's in them it's brownie jelly yes said the brownie just like what you had in the great hall yes said mabel slowly and her eyes wandered away from the dollhouse to the jars of jelly she remembered how delicious the jelly was how it tasted like all the loveliest kinds of ice cream blended together with pounded almonds and chocolate and strawberries and as she thought of it her little mouth watered and she smacked her lips it was awfully good said she yes said the brownie it was the best thing i ever tasted in my life said she yes said the brownie i can only have one thing can i yes said the brownie mabel stood first on one foot and then on the other foot and put her finger in her mouth and looked hard at the doll house and then at the jars of brownie jelly well she said at last do you know i think i'll take a jar of brownie jelly and she snatched one of the silver jars from the top of the pile then brownie laughed so that he could hardly speak mabel blushed but she kept a tight hold on the jar are you really going to keep it asked the brownie yes said mabel firmly and i think i'll go now please brownie will you take my hand and lead me out of the room i want to shut my eyes so that i won't see any of the other things for fear i should change my mind the brownie laughed again and finally he took some silver paper and wrapped up the jar and its spoon into a neat little package then he led mabel out of the treasure room into the passage and locked the door they went back through the winding passage and the halls till they came to the room where the brownie king was sitting on his throne aha said he when he saw mabel so you're back again did you choose a present yes king she said and i thank you very very much and what did you choose asked he smiling i think i can guess was it the talking doll no king it wasn't the doll what not the doll well well that it must have been a beautiful necklace no king said mabel it wasn't a necklace then it was the music box no king said mabel it wasn't the music box either what why i don't understand perhaps it was a lace dress no 
said mabel oh yes said the king i remember of course of course it was the dollhouse no said mabel it wasn't the dollhouse the king nearly fell off his throne he was so surprised then for goodness sake he said tell me what it was well said mabel looking down it was a a jar of brownie jelly the king lay back on his throne and shook with laughter till mabel thought he would fall to pieces ha 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 he roared a jar of jelly a jar of jelly yes said mabel it's the best thing i ever tasted ha 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 a jar of jelly cried he again well well you're a real human little girl aren't you a jar of jelly then he stooped down and patted her head and said well good-bye for now mabel i'm sorry to have you go for you've given me such a good laugh but no little girls ever come here nor any other human beings so i suppose i shall not see you again good-bye and then he began laughing once more and the last thing that mabel heard him say was a jar of jelly she went back into the great hall to say good-bye to the other brownies who all shook hands with her and patted her on the head and then the soldier brownie brought a torch and said that he would light the way for her out of the cave so the great door was opened again and mabel went out into the dark tunnel the soldier brownie going ahead of her with the torch when they had turned the corner and could see the daylight glimmering at the entrance of the cave the soldier brownie in his turn shook hands with mabel said good-bye put out the torch and quickly disappeared around the corner mabel heard him going back to the stone door and soon she heard it open and shut again and then she crept out of the dark hole through the thicket and the blackberry bushes and ran home as fast as she could leaving her sunbonnet and her basket of berries on the ground but hugging the jar of jelly tight in her arms grandma was sitting on the veranda when mabel ran up all out of breath oh grandma grandma she cried where do you think i've been why down in the woods i suppose said grandma yes but where else i'm sure i can't guess answered grandma well grandma i've been in the brownies's home visiting the brownies then she told the whole story just as it has been told here and when she finished she cried out there now what do you think of that grandma smiled and patted her little girl's head i think she said that somebody fell asleep in the woods and had a beautiful long midsummer dream oh no cried mabel i didn't dream a word of it it really really happened to me and i was just as wide awake as you are grandma truly truly well well mabel said grandma of course you think you saw all these strange things but there are really no brownies nowadays outside of picture books so you see you must have dreamed it did i dream this grandma asked mabel suddenly holding up the package wrapped in silver paper grandma looked surprised and took the package and unrolled it out came a beautiful little silver jar with a silver lid and a gold spoon fastened to it by a bit of fine silver wire on the top of the lid was carved a picture of the brownie king and his crown upon his head and the same picture was cut on the handle of the spoon grandma's eyes opened very wide she did not speak for a long time and then she said it's all very curious mabel and i will not speak about it just now it is time for you to have your supper and be put to bed but to-morrow morning after breakfast i will go with you to the woods and you can show me the place where you found the entrance to the cave so the next morning grandma and mabel went together down into the woods and mabel led her to the thicket of blackberry bushes sure enough there lay mabel's sunbonnet just where she had left it the day before in the bushes they also found the basket nearly full of berries mabel showed grandma how she had crawled through the bushes to the great rock i'm pretty old to creep on the ground said grandma after peering into the thicket but i think i'll try it just for once so she actually got down on her hands and knees and crept in among the bushes just as mabel had done but when she reached the rock on the other side she found no opening for an enormous stone had been wedged into the hole so that hardly a crack was left grandma took both hands and tried to move it but it was too heavy and was wedged in too tight and when she gave it up she heard a little laugh on the other side of the stone she crawled back to where mabel was waiting there's no hole now she said it's been stopped yes replied mabel nodding her little head wisely the king brownie said that no one would ever get in again they walked home together and grandma kept very silent about it all that day mabel gave her a taste of the brownie jelly and every day she herself ate just one spoonful of it till it was all gone and then she put the empty silver jar and the spoon on the shelf in her own room to remind her of the time when she had visited the brownies End of chapter 11
Chapter Twelve of the Adventures of Mabel by Harry Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: The Rescue of Jack. After her first visit to the giant's castle, Mabel went there regularly twice a week. She and Elsie became great friends, and as Elsie grew stronger, they began to plan for the time when she and Mabel could go out into the fields and have a picnic. But as yet, she was not able to get any further than the courtyard. It was just at this time that something happened which I'm now going to tell. Over the hill beyond the brook, where the frogs were, stood a small white house, and in it lived a little boy, about seven years old, named Jack. He had not lived there long, so that Mabel did not know him very well. But he had come to her house once or twice to see her and Walter, and they were getting to be pretty well acquainted. One day Mabel was sitting on the lawn, playing with Towser, when Jack's father came by, walking very fast and looking anxiously in all directions as he walked. When he saw Mabel, he stopped and asked, Have you seen anything of my little boy today? No, said Mabel. He hasn't been here. Jack's father didn't wait to say anything more, but hurried on up the road. He had been gone about an hour, when back he came, still walking very fast and looking all about him. Did you find him? asked Mabel, as he passed by the gate. No, and no one has seen him anywhere. I can't think what has become of him, for he's been away since ten o'clock this morning, and it's now two. He didn't come home at noon for dinner, and I fear that something has happened to him. Well, said Mabel, if I see him, I'll tell him that you are worried about him. Thank you, said Jack's father. And please ask everybody that passes if they have seen a little boy in velvet knickerbockers and a scotch cap and he hurried away in the direction of his own home. Mabel thought it over for quite a while, and then she felt that it would be a good thing for her to have Rex saddled and to ride along the roads, asking whether anyone had seen or heard of Jack. So presently she was galloping past the cross dog's house and the frog's brook, and just as she was near Jack's house, she saw the butcher riding along in his cart. Have you seen anything of a little boy in velvet knickerbockers and a scotch cap? she asked him. Yes, he said. I saw him this morning, going down the road that turns to the left after you go some distance past the hill. I've just told his father so, and he's got a horse and has gone to look for him down that way. Mabel let Rex walk as she went along in the same direction. She thought that if Jack's father had gone down the road to the left, there was no need for her to go that way too. Yet she decided that she would ride slowly along to meet the two when they came back. So she went on through the woods and past the kitty cats, and then she reached the road that turned to the left. Just at that moment she heard the sounds of a horse's hooves galloping in the distance, and she stopped Rex and waited. Nearer and nearer came the rider, and presently Mabel saw Jack's father riding a bay horse and galloping up the hill like mad. His head was bare, his face was as white as a sheet of paper, and he was lashing the horse, whose sides and legs were covered with dust and foam. "'What's the matter?' called out Mabel, as he plunged into the main road, where she was sitting on Rex's back. He pulled up his horse for a moment. "'Oh!' he cried. "'It's terrible! I heard that Jack had gone down this way, and I rode after him till I crossed a big stone bridge, and found a lot of men all dressed in red and working in the fields. When I asked them if they had seen my little boy, they told me that they had, that he had strolled down the road, and that a great giant had found him and carried him off to his castle. I didn't know there was a giant in this country, but there is, and they say that my little boy is to be eaten for his breakfast tomorrow morning. What are you going to do? asked Mabel, who was greatly excited by this news. Do? he cried. Why, I'm going to get all the men in the town to come, with guns and axes and hammers, and break into the giant's castle and get my boy out. I'm afraid a giant is too big for you to fight, said Mabel. He could step on you and kill you with one foot. So the men in the road told me, said Jack's father, but I don't care. I'll do what I can. I'll burn and chop and slash, and if he kills me, why, I'd rather die than live without my little boy. Mabel looked very serious. Stop a minute, she said. I want to tell you something. Don't try to break into the castle, but just wait and let me see what I can do. If you will, I promise that Jack shall not be hurt. Jack's father stared at her in astonishment. What, you, a little girl? Yes, said Mabel. I know what I can do. 
and I promise you to bring Jack safely home by sunset. Wait at your house and see. But Mabel, said he earnestly, you mustn't go near the giant's castle. You are too little to know what a giant is. He is a fearful monster, and if he sees you, he will catch you and eat you at the same time as he eats my poor little Jack. Mabel smiled. No, she said, don't be afraid. I promise not to get into any danger, but I promise also to save Jack before sunset. Don't do anything till then. Well, said Jack's father, I couldn't get any men together before that time, so I'll promise you. But be sure you don't run into any danger. I don't want you to be eaten too. With these words, he whipped his horse and galloped away again toward the town to see if any men would help him attack the giant's castle. When he had disappeared down the road in a cloud of dust, Mabel patted Rex on the neck and spoke to him. Rex, she said, we've got a long, hard ride before us, but I want you to do your best so that I can keep my promise and save poor little Jack. She shook the reins and Rex bounded forward down the road to the left. He flew along like an arrow. His hoofs seemed scarcely to touch the ground, as he strained, his head forward and dashed over the road. His mane streamed in the air, his neck quivered, and he galloped faster than he had ever done in all his life. "'Good, Rex!' cried Mabel, as he sped along with a flight like a bird's. On they went over hill and dale, on, 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 clattering through the grass and woods, thundering over the great stone bridge on between the fields where the men in red were working, on, on, on never stopping till they dashed down the last hill, and found themselves before Cormoran's huge castle, with its mighty towers, its gilded roof, and its massive gateway. Mabel tugged at the chain, and the great bell clanged. The gate flew open, and she clattered into the courtyard, where the red spearmen saluted her. Here, take my horse, someone, cried Mabel, as she slid to the ground. Do you want to see the little lady Elsie? asked one of the men. No, said Mabel, I want to see the giant. The man hesitated a little. "'You can't see him today,' said he. "'He's very much out of sorts. He's shut himself up in his den, and has given orders that no one is to disturb him.' "'I can't help it,' said Mabel. "'I must see him. Please help me up the stairs, someone.' The man who had spoken bowed, and led her through the doorway, into the castle, and lifted her up the great steps, one by one, till she had reached the top, and then he turned and ran away as fast as he could. Mabel walked straight to the door of the den. Her heart beat very fast, yet she did not hesitate a moment, but beat on the door with the handle of her riding whip. "'Who's that?' roared a terrific voice within. "'It's me!' called Mabel, as loud as she could, but her voice was too weak and small to be heard through the thick door. "'Who's that?' bellowed the giant. "'Go away!' Mabel beat the door again. "'Ha!' shouted Cormoran, and Mabel could hear him jumping up from his oaken chair. Knock again and I'll eat you up. Mabel was dreadfully frightened, but she raised her whip and beat the door again. In half a second it flew wide open with a crash, and Cormoran rushed to the entrance. He was a fearful sight. His tangled red hair stood out all over his head like a blaze of fire. His lips were curled up so as to show his great tusks, and his eyes rolled and glared furiously like those of some monstrous beast. You shall die, he howled and then he saw that it was Mabel. Please, Cormoran, I want to see you about something very much, said Mabel, in her soft little voice, which trembled with fear as she spoke. Cormoran looked at her a moment, and he seemed less angry, but his face still wore a scowl. Well, he said shortly, come in. Mabel went into the den and climbed up on a footstool. What is it? growled Cormoran. Come, make a short story of it. Please, said Mabel, folding her hands in her lap. Have you caught a little boy today? Yes, grunted Cormoran. He's ordered for breakfast. What of it? Oh, Cormoran, pleaded Mabel. Please don't eat him. His father is wild about it. He says he doesn't want to live if you eat his little boy. What do I care, whether he lives or not, growled the giant. But Jack's such a good little boy, said Mabel, and he never did you any harm. You won't be so cruel as to eat him, will you? Why not? Little boys are good eating. Why shouldn't I eat him just as you eat pigeons? Pigeons never did you any harm. Mabel was in despair. She felt that she could say nothing to persuade the great hungry giant, but she resolved to try once more. Cormoran, she said, you know I've been here often and often because you asked me to, and I played with Elsie, and you said yourself the other day that I did more for her than anyone else. 
when i first came she was pale and so weak that she couldn't walk and now she's so strong and well that next week she's going out of doors again just as well as ever you love her ever so much don't you well jack's papa loves him just as much as you do elsie and how will he feel when he knows that his little boy is dead now cormoran if you think i've done anything for your elsie let jack go for my sake because he is my playmate too if you will i will love it better than the gold belt or than anything else and i'll never forget it you will won't you please do the great giant looked down on the little figure sitting on the footstool pleading so earnestly with two big tears in her eyes for a long while he kept silent but a great gleam of good nature came into his eyes his face softened and at last he said well mabel i do almost anything for you come he took a great bunch of keys from his belt and strode out of the room to the staircase mabel ran after him as fast as her little legs could carry her and he picked her up in one hand and bore her gently down the stairs then he unlocked a great iron door behind which was a dark narrow stairway with short winding steps he's down here in the cellar said cormoran they went down the narrow stairs together into the dimly lighted cellar it was an enormous place about half a mile long with huge stacks of wine barrels and casks of ale piled about as soon as mabel's eyes became used to the darkness she saw a row of cells each with a great iron door and a heavy lock all of them were open but one he's in there said the giant pointing to the cell whose door was shut then he took a big key and put it into the lock and turned it mabel laid her head against the door and then she heard a little voice inside the cell sobbing and crying oh don't eat me please don't eat me said the voice it was jack will you let me open the door asked mabel of the giant and please don't let him see you when he comes out he'll be so frightened as soon as i pull the door open please hide behind the big piles of barrels all right said cormoran smiling mabel knocked on the door with her little fist jack she called who's that said the voice inside the cell it's mabel answered she oh mabel called the voice what are you doing here has the giant caught you too no said mabel cheerily and don't be afraid jack i'm going to open the door and let you out and take you home jack gave a shout of joy then mabel took hold of the door with both of her hands and pulled with all her might the door swung slowly open and as cormoran hid himself behind the barrels out came jack oh mabel mabel he cried how did you get here and how did you open the door never mind now jack we must hurry home as fast as we can come she led the way through the cellar and jack followed her wondering they went up the cellar stairs and out into the courtyard where the men in red stood up and saluted mabel with their spears bring my horse out please said mabel and be as quick as you can they led out rex and helped mabel into the saddle lift this little boy up behind me said mabel and they did so now jack she said put your arms around my waist and hold on tight and be careful not to fall off are you ready yes said jack and mabel spoke to rex and he started out of the courtyard trotting till he reached the open road and then breaking into a long gallop as he set his head toward home meanwhile jack's father had ridden about the country and had collected all the men he could to lead them against the giant's castle in case mabel did not return by sunset about forty men had promised to help him and he had gathered them all together into a company on the top of the hill near his own house they now stood there looking down upon the long stretch of road that wound around the other hills some of the men had guns others had pistols and some were armed with clubs and axes and pitchforks and crowbars and scythes behind the highest hill the great red sun was already beginning to set it's nearly time said jack's father to the men the little girl said that she would be back by sunset and if she doesn't come you may be sure that the giant has caught her and is going to eat her too the men clashed their weapons and looked very fierce we'll save them both cried they jack's father kept his eyes on the sun lower and lower it sank behind the hill until only the upper part of it could be seen it's almost gone said he with a groan she's not coming back listen cried one of the men i hear something they all leaned forward to listen a far-off sound like the beat of a horse's hoofs came faintly to their ears it's a horse cried one look far away in the distance a tiny cloud of dust could be seen on and on nearer and nearer it came until they saw a black speck moving swiftly down the road while the sound of galloping grew louder and louder the men all strained their eyes 
it is a horse cried jack's father eagerly yes and i see a little white figure on his back it must be mabel thank heaven she's not lost at any rate nearer and nearer came the horse plunging along through the dust of the road yes called out one of the men and there's something else on his back too beyond the little girl what is it yes why it's jack a tremendous shout went up from forty throats every man flung his hat into the air and next his weapon all cheering and cheering and shouting like mad and then right into the midst of them up the side of the hill dashed mabel with jack behind her carried along by noble old rex who was covered with foam from head to foot mabel pulled him up and he stopped his flanks quivering and his nostrils panting jack's father rushed at his little boy and snatched him from the horse's back hugging him tight to his heart the men swarmed around mabel and lifted her out of the saddle and then two of them held her up high in the air while the whole band formed a procession and began marching toward her home they sang and cheered and shouted till the hillsides rang grandma heard the noise and came out to the gate she saw forty men all marching toward her and on the shoulders of two of them she saw a little girl sitting with an arm about each of their necks behind them another man was leading rex by the bridle rein why what does all this mean cried grandma and for answer the forty men gave one great shout hurrah 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 mabel end of chapter recording by april 6090 california united states of america end of the adventures of mabel by harry peck